in this fourth series. We're going to be finding the fingerprints of God and the origin of the life forms on our planet, and finally the insoling process to create modern man. In other words, at what point did it appear that the soul was added to Homo sapiens? Now let's briefly look at the creative events that happened and discussed in the prior part three section, Formation of the Earth. Our Earth was formed from the same nebula as our second generation star, which is the Sun. Our nebula just happened to contain all the 94 essential elements to allow life. Remember, this is these were put into the nebula many, many years before the Earth was formed. Our planet just happened to exist in a habitable zone from the Sun, a very specific distance. Our Earth just happened to have a magnetic iron core, similar to the Sun, so it could be magnetized, providing a magnetic field to fend off most asteroids. Our Earth just happened to be struck by a huge carbonaceous asteroid very early. It actually had a name, Thea, and it delivered ice and carbon. Now, ice obviously is going to be water and carbon. These were the two essential materials we needed to have, and it was delivered right to the surface of the Earth. Without enough carbon, enough water, no life is possible. Then it just happens that ice floats. It was created such that when water freezes, ice floats. Otherwise, the oceans would have completely frozen during the cold, the snowball periods in our geologic timeline. No ocean, no life. We concluded there was no logical, spontaneous reason for these events without being orchestrated by a creator. Science offers no other explanation or answers. The universe and life do not exist on the basis of random coincidence. Now at this point I want to go back to the previous discussion topics and have you remember what the supernova did by making all the 94 essential elements. This is way in the distant past and then the nifty nebula came along and they collected them all and our nifty nebula put them in to our planet. And so they made the star in the center, that's the sun, and the planets are created out here, and that was going to be us and the other planets in our solar system. And our planet received all 94 elements. All of those came in there. And how do we know that they were there? Is they can look at the light emanating from these things and turn it into the wavelength distribution, and they characterize the, each of these. So all the 94 elements are, right now, the astrophysicists can see them in similar nebula. So they're all collected out here. We know that that's true. And then they be it put into our planet. Well, that's what they did many, many years ago. And now, now that we have life, now is when we need them and we use them. For instance, hydrogen and water make water. We have to have water. Water and carbon make up most of our bodies, probably 90%. Calcium and phosphorus go ahead and make our skeletons in the shells of marine animals. Phosphorus is used. We already talked about ATP. That's phosphorus. That's our, the fuel that every cell uses. Carbon and nitrogen make amino acids to make the RNA and the DNA, single strand, double strand. Calcium, magnesium, and other metals are used as coenzymes. Coenzymes for metab metabolism don't work unless some of these, some of these uh, metals, were, metals are, have to be in as coenzymes. Iron is used by red cells to deliver oxygen to our functional cells. Sulfur is used as a, a common bridge in biochemical bonds. So this is why we call the supernova stardust and the nifty nebula major creative events because they did all this for us. And now we're going to use it for life and for how the whole world functions. Now you might ask, what are we going to do in part four? What are we going to examine? We're going to go back over the creation of the early single-cell eukaryocytes and demonstrate how they add the nuclei and the organelles which include mitochondria and chloroplasts, and they developed a double-stranded DNA. And this all happens about a billion years. So about two million years after getting the primitive prokaryocytes, we get the eukaryocytes. Then after that, you get complex multicellular eukaryotic forms. Then we develop plants, animals, fish. They have limbs. They have eyes. They develop all sorts of features. Once you've gone to multicellular, that requires a whole lot more DNA, just out of nowhere, hard to believe. Then you develop some of the animals, the marine animals, early ones develop a neural net. 
The mammals and hominids develop an early neocortex, and the Homo sapiens demonstrate the current six-layer neocortex. And after that, we're going to look at the introduction of the human soul into man, which allows us to have a sense of self-awareness, syntactic language, sense of well-being, awareness of God, and many other features. Now, we move along Earth's timeline, down to one of the more important events, and that's the formation of eukaryocytes. Now, karyocyte means cells, and you means a good cell, but it also you can translate it as the your, your cells, because this is where we all came from. The other cells were primitive, but right about a billion years, you had these formation of the eukaryocyte cells. This is a huge creative event, as big as the Big Bang, because all of a sudden, you were able to take this simple, comp simple DNA that they had before, it was a single-stranded DNA. Now you could make double-stranded DNA, put it in a nucleus, and develop a mitochondria, which is a little organelle that makes energy. This is your this is the engine for every cell, every cell you have in your body. You have to use this, to, and it has to have it's oxygen-driven, so it has it's an oxygen metabolism, and also it made chloroplast. Now you realize that both the mitochondria and the nucleus and the chloroplast had to generate all new DNA. These are long chains of, as we've talked before, long chains of proteins that are able to be used as a template. In other words, it's the instruction manual for everything in the cell to do. So out of the blue, you had to create two new kinds of DNA in the mitochondria and the chloroplast and go from a single strand to a double stranded DNA in the nucleus. These are incredibly complex events. And how it can happen in a toxic soup of the primordial sea is beyond any question. Uh, it's just totally unreasonable if it's random. It has to be a creative event. So once you've done that, now we're going to be able to have one form that will have the nucleus, mitochondria, and the chloroplast, and they're going to become plants. And the others will be the nucleus and the mitochondria. They'll drop the chloroplast. Remember, anything green. So every green leaf, whatever, has the chloroplast. It's not a, it's not complex. If it's green, it's got the chloroplast. And so the others are the, so that we can make plants and we can make animals. And once this happens, at about a billion years, and you get down to 541 million years, all of a sudden you have what was called the Cambrian explosion, where all of a sudden we're going to unfold all of the living creatures on Earth right at that point. Now, why are eukaryocyte formation? Why is it such a big deal? And why are we calling the DNA, the mitochondria, and the chloroplast major creative events? Well, I'll show you. The early archaea and the bacteria were simple, simple cells. They didn't use oxygen, so they had anaerobic metabolism. Later, the bacteria formed a, a type called cyanobacteria. They started to use chlorophyll and did make some oxygen and putting it in the atmosphere. But the cyanobacteria didn't really need the oxygen, so that's kind of unusual. Then along come at a billion years the eukaryocytes. They've added nuclei, first time nuclei, and nuclear DNA, mitochondria with its own DNA, and chloroplasts in the following manner. Now, the, So we have early simple cells, and they just stay simple cells, and they're still here today as simple cells. Then along come the eukaryocytes, and they divide depending on the following. If the, the, here's the nuclear DNA, so the nuclear DNA runs all the metabolic processes, so it makes everything. Well, it's all, all the proteins that it makes for enzymes, for cell walls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But now they also add mitochondria for aerobic metabolism. And these that have, these cells end up as eukaryotic animals. The other type starts with the same process. They have a nucleus and they have a cell. They add the mitochondria, because they're going to also use the uh, energy from the mitochondria, but they add the chloroplasts, and these become all the eukaryotic plants. Here comes the chlorophyll. Here's what the simple cells look like. They're green because chlorophyll is green. They make oxygen and glucose, and that's what the eukaryotic animals need, along with glucose, to exist. So here's our list of the seven major creative events. We're down to number four, the dynamic DNA. 
DNA is the cookbook for every cell. It is very complex, composed of amino acids. So the amino acids had to be formed. Then they had to be arranged in a very precise way to make all the different proteins we have to live. It's a very complex process and very complex structure. It just can't occur as an ac accidental random event. So here's our cell. Here's the nucleus. And here's this complex DNA. It has a sugar uh, ribbon going around the outside, and then the amino acids jump between them. And they go ahead and they break into chromosomes and genes. The genes are the parts of the chromosome. These are very long. So these are, here's just a few sections, but it's, it's very, very long. And it gets longer as you develop structure. So this has to create, it's coming out of the primordial soup. Can you imagine this happens by random? It's impossible. We said DNA is the cookbook. The nuclear DNA is the cookbook. It makes, makes, takes care of almost everything in a living cell except energy. That's mitochondrial's job. It has a recipe for the inner and outer cell walls, a recipe for enzymes that make all your digestion and metabolism work. It has a recipe for movement. It has a recipe for getting rid of debris. And it has a recipe for reproduction. All loaded in this complex structure in nuclear DNA. Now the next of the seven major creative events is the jolly green chloroplast. The chloroplasts provide a way to efficiently generate oxygen and glucose. We need that because neural structures will run on glucose. Muscles can run on fat and glucose, but you're, once you get a neural system, you have to have glucose. So it had to, from the very beginning, start making both. It made the, both these out of atmospheric carbon dioxide and sunlight. So, so it used what's up in the atmosphere to create something, put oxygen in the atmosphere, and allow animals to have a, a aerobic metabolism. Now, animal karyocytes can use the aerobic metabolism for energy to run all our complex parts in our brain. You can see why we give it an award. This is one of the seven major creative events because this is a big deal. Without this, the next step won't happen. Again, why are chloroplasts such a major creative event? Well, they enable the circle of life because they are able to make oxygen out of carbon dioxide and sunlight and make glucose, and that's necessary for all the neural structures to run and most other structures as well, but particularly any once you get to brain in the complex animals, once they get a brain. So we said that uh, they make oxygen and glucose, they're green plants because they have chlorophyll, and this is what they do, and they supply everything that the eukaryotic animals need. This is truly a remarkable creative event in God's visionary plan. There's just no other way. This is creative design. Now this is a graph of oxygen concentration and actually other chemicals that are mixed in the, in the atmosphere. And of course when they're mixed in the atmosphere, they also get dissolved in water. So this is, with a, this is a primordial soup that the early animal formation came from. The early creatures, the bacteria and archaea had to grow out of this mess that was uh, we call the primordial soup. And it had up here methane and ammonia and sulfur dioxide. It had a lot of nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and it was all mixed into the water and in the atmosphere. Now the water, remember, also evaporates and goes up into the atmosphere as well. That's why it's listed. Now the water over time stays about the same. But the conditions change significantly. So the, here's the nitrogen. It stays, goes down, and comes back up, and it stays about the same. The carbon dioxide can go down and come up. And partially it's because it's being used when you get the eukaryotic cells. And partially it goes up and down for other reasons. And that's what causes some of the disaster effects called extinctions during this period of time. We'll see that happening. But with the uh, initial initiation of the cyanobacteria and the presence of chlorophyll, oxygen starts to rise somewhere about 2 billion years. And it really kicks off when you get oxygen from the eukaryotic plants. So th this is the oxygen. It's not non-existent here, and now it runs currently at 21%. This is the water. Carbon dioxide stays about the same, although it does vary over time. Nitrogen is about the same, and all this toxic stuff disappears to make a nice, very nice atmosphere. And when the atmosphere is nice, then the water is nice as well. Now, for the seven major creative events, we're moving on to number six, the mighty mitochondria. This is a big deal. All of these are, and that's why we have them as major creative events. But the mitochondria have their own DNA, so it's mitochondrial DNA, and it comes from maternal genes, because at this time you already have 
the sexual reproduction. So you have a male and a female component in the mitochondrial DNA. All comes from the maternal genes. But what do the mitochondria do? They make the fuel to run the engines of every cell. They supply what's called ATP, the adenosine triphosphate. And here's this little bit of phosphate in there. And this has the energy to run every system that there is. Without ATP, you only have two minutes of ATP loss and you're in deep trouble. This ATP allows, is the energy source for every cell to do its work. Now it's important to understand why mitochondria are important. Why they are creative events, because they truly are a miracle. Here's the mitochondria, and it has inside it has another part that has another cell wall. So this is the inside of it, and this is the outside of it, but it's not outside the mitochondria. So what happens is you have chemical reactions. Meta metabolism produces high energy molecules. Here comes these molecules. And when, when it gets in here, the mitochondria says, oh, I know what to do with this. And it brings it up by these little structures in the surface of the inner mitochondrial membrane. And these go ahead and they clip out protons and leave electrons behind until you get a whole lot of the protons on the out, outside of the mitochondria itself. Well, they accumulate out here. They're not outside the mitochondria altogether. This, that's out here. But this, they're inside the mitochondrial first membrane, but not the second. They accumulate out here and then shoot through a gap. And it's actually a gap. It looks like a water wheel or a, and uh, as they shoot through, they turn the little water wheel, which goes and compresses ADP, adenosine diphosphate, into ATP, identified adenosine triphosphate. This ATP, that's all you got to remember is ATP, is the fuel for every metabolic process in the whole body. Every single one of them needs this. And as they shoot through, then they, they need oxygen. So oxygen comes along. And the hydrogens and the electrons get together and they make water. So water is benign and it's good for you. But these elements, if there's no oxygen, these elements become very toxic. This whole process is driven by mitochondrial DNA. DNA has to create all of these structures that have to work in concert for us to make ATP and have life. That is truly a creative miracle. Now the fourth creation event is DNA and it comes in the nucleus and a little special organelle called inside a cell that generates all the energy but it has its own DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and then the chloroplast is in mitochondria and nuclei are in plants and animals, but the chloroplast, remember this is green stuff. See it's green. So anything with green, any green leaf has this chloroplast in it. And that's what its DNA looks like. But the DNA is just an instruction manual, but it's written not in words or numbers, but in proteins. So all these little protein links in here have information. And the cell has to translate it here to make any, anything it wants, any kind of protein or any, anything. It has to read these things out and then make it, which is an absolute mystery how that could happen in a single cell at the beginning, in this primordial soup, this toxic soup that's living in, in the sea, and that just cannot happen in any reasonable way by any random motion, random activity of anything. This has to have the Creator's help. This is all part of the Creator's design, and part of the plan. Now, these are creative event equivalents. This is what the eukaryotic cells when they became multicellular and more com complex organisms, this is what had to develop. They had to change from a unicellular to a multicellular organism. They had to develop sexual reproduction with the mother and father genes, uh, as opposed to mitosis from asexual. They had to figure out how to take initial germinal cells. This is absolutely incredible. So they start as just a single, or, uh, single cell joining another cell, the male and female. Now you have one cell and it starts to divide. But from those early divisions, all the different parts have to be developed with a widely diverse functions. You have to make a digestive system, a neural system, a metabolic system. It has to make some sort of skeleton, muscles, et cetera, et cetera. All from these germinal cells that start out as just one and two cells, three cells, four cells, five cells, and it goes on up. Yet every cell is, has a DNA mechanism to decide where it goes, where it develops, and what it does. 
Absolutely incredible. Every new system, you realize, is new DNA that has to add to it. It's not just random adjustments of prior DNA. Scientists actually recognize the differences in the eukaryotic cells derived from living things, but they cannot answer how it happened or why it happened. Now we've watched the Earth, Earth's timeline and the development of living creatures, but now we've moved on to development of both types of plants and types of animals. So what has to have happened in here is the DNA in the plants is going to decide to make complex plants, and it's going to make marine plants, it's going to make seed-bearing plants, it's going to make trees. And every time any of these things happen, a significant change in the DNA has to happen. And the question is, who drives that? Well, you can't expect the little creatures without any brain to do it. It has to be a creative event. There's no reason why they would want to just move from one spot to another or change unless there's a, a cause. And the, each of these changes requires a significant alteration of their DNA. You have to add a whole lot of complex material to your DNA status to do anything. And the same is true of animals because now we're going to get the single cells and multi-cell plants and then animals and then you get multicellular animals and then you start getting actual oxygen breathing animals and plants coming onto the earth which is now cooled down to a usable level. You start getting fishes, then the tetrapods, then the insects, and so on. We'll get the rest of it later. And when we move on, we have to put in perspective what this means. For instance, if you, t if you here's a challenge for you. Fill a pail of sand at the beach and put it on your porch. How long do you think it would take for a frog to hop out of that pail by random chance? You can see that this is a very complex process. It has to have intelligent design. It has to have the power of a creator with infinite wisdom. After insects, we move on to the next era. And this is called the era of the dinosaurs and the large, large mammals. And this is called the Triassic part, uh, part, the Jurassic part. Remember the movie Jurassic Park? Well, this is when these happened, and they come down to the last is the Cretaceous part. And you're going to get the small animals and the big animals developing. But uh, an asteroid hit the Earth, and whatever it produced in the atmosphere killed all the dinosaurs. So they never made it. But the little animals went on. Now, finally, we get to the Cenozoic era, which began 66 million years ago, and it goes all the way up to the present. So beginning back in 66 million years ago, the continents now formed, separated by seas. It wasn't just one big landmass. The plants are kind of like today. The first primates to show up were the monkeys at about 55 million years ago, then the apes and chimps about 7.5 million years ago, then the earliest man, but they're not hoping homo sapiens like we are. They had different names, began about 1.5 million years ago. Then finally you get to the fossil record of 200,000 years ago where you start having homo sapiens show up and we call the the people then the Y chromosome Adam and the mitochondrial Eve. So those are our first great 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 grandparents. Now we're down for 200,000 years you get the initial homo sapiens but the first group from 200,000 to 75,000 they were their fossils were in northern Africa and they left absolutely no trace other than their skeletons. They seem to function more like chimpanzees. So they didn't have, they didn't create anything, they didn't save anything, they didn't build anything. But right at 75,000 years, a dramatic change happens, a functional change, and we call this an ensouling event. So you're getting a human soul coming in. At this time, man, all of a sudden, in a very short period of time, so it comes down to this point, 75,000 years, all of a sudden they developed language, they could talk, they had syntactic language, they had cave art, so they appreciated art, they buried their dead with amulets for the next world, so they had a sense of the of uh, being the real world and then the spiritual world. They had counting sticks, so they had math, began to form colonies and began to migrate around the world, depending on what they wanted to do, what conditions they wanted to live in. In essence, these are the acquired features of a human soul. This is much different than the initial uh, gr group of human beings. And from here it goes down to the present time. Now we have a lot of history because we have known civilizations right up to the present. 
Now of interest, this is an analysis of DNA gene from mitochondrial type of DNA. We're looking at a specific enzyme, and it's by a, this group that studied 100 species from, uh, including humans from the gen bank, so all the animals and the humans. Here's the principle. Here's this enzyme. It's present in all mammals. And it's a coding gene that allows us uh, for a comparison between species. Now, the choices are, if there's many variations, so this, if this gene is really heterogeneous, that would indicate the species were derived from multiple different sources, which is the basis of Darwinian evolution, that you actually have transitional species. However, if there's little or no variation, if it's homogeneous, in the structure of the genes that indicates the species have been derived only from its own cell line, which is called adaptive evolution because things change with time depending on the environment. All right, here's the results. The results were looking at all of the animals and human beings. There was very little variation for this gene within 100 animal species, which indicates they're all distinct individual cell lines and not an admixture. In other words, this is direct opposition to the Darwinian trans-species evolutionary thesis. So it means that all of the animal se sequences for the, for the species stayed the same. So birds were always birds, frogs were always frogs, alligators were always alligators, including the mitochondrial variation in Homo sapiens is clearly different from the hominids, the monkeys and apes and all that. Thus, man has not been derived from hominids the apes, monkeys, or chimpanzees, as Darwinian evolution would have suggested based on this analysis. It's only one analysis, but it was a very good one. So, here's some potential questions. How did animals which develop on Earth when all the earlier life forms were in the sea? How did they just decide to come on land? And how did all the animal species regenerate after each of the six extin extinctions? So, in the world's history, we didn't talk about that. But the, the divisions in the time were based on something happened in the environment to kill off most of the animal and plant species, and yet they came back in each time. So many of these were ice ages. So this is a very interesting study, and it seems very logical that the Darwin, Darwinian evolution with trans species going from one to another is not correct, but adaptive evolution of change within a species is correct. Now the final of the seven major creative events, and the most important obviously, is despite the presence of all of the chemistry and all the physics and everything that's gone on up to this point, nothing lives unless it gets the spark of life. We don't know where that comes from, but we know it has to emanate from the Creator. It doesn't happen spontaneously. You can't just put chemicals together in a pot and have it happen. So this is a spark of life. We give credit to God for that. Also, the introduction of our own personal soul. We mentioned that in the last slide. So the, these are the greatest events, the spark of life and the introduction of our soul. These are the greatest of the creative events, and this is why we should all be eternally grateful. Now, what do we mean by the idea of soul? Our soul is a unique part of all of us. It, Unfortunately, you can't find it. It doesn't. There's no spot in the brain uh, where it exists, and I, that's what I've done as a, a career and looked for it for years, and I can't find it. So it's really a spiritual part of us. We know that there's where there's we can find where sensation is, movement, memory, language, heart and breathing functions, and even personality. We can find that in the areas of the brain, but we can't find the soul. It appears to be a part of the human spirit. So it's a spiritual component, but it's very real, and it's what. What does it do? Our soul is the origin for self-awareness. We recognize where we are, how things are going, good or bad. We recognize it and know about it. We have a sense of goodness, what is good and what's not good. We have a sense of love, and this is a covenant love, not just the physical love. This is the part that you really like somebody for their own sake. Then you have a sense of beauty, sense of doing the right thing, sense of distinguishing truth from falsehood, and especially a sense of well-being and purpose in our life. This is all part of the soul. Our soul is what connects us to God, our Creator. We're glad our soul allows us to sense God's presence through the Holy Spirit. And we know that God is all around us because we've seen all the creative events. And God is accessible through prayer and Scripture because remember the Bible is God's love letter to His creation. Now we're approaching the end 
of this discussion. But I offer a question. We're dealing with a question of probability. All of life is a probability. So do you think a tornado could pass through a junkyard and randomly produce an airplane with a pilot gassed up and ready to take off? Is that probable? No, it's not probable. Is it even possible? I don't think so. Is it reasonable? Surely not. But that's what our creation story is about. When we look at the story of our universe, our planet, all the plants and animals, and all these parts are fine-tuned for life. This gen just cannot be the sum of a random tornado-like events like the origin of the airplane. That position is, to me, unreasonable, if not completely impossible as an explanation. What's the opposite? Well, the creative events we've discussed have no apparent cause. The spark of life has no apparent cause. So in the absence of physical causation, because everything has physical has a causation, and now we have causation events that can't be explained on a physical basis, then we have no other reasonable explanation other than the intervention by a transphysical creator applying intelligent planning and design. It's not enough to just make something. It has to be made in the right order and evolve over time with adaptive evolution to survive all the changes in nature. So we can just look around our everyday world and recognize the fingerprints of our Creator, our God. They're just everywhere. So what's our bottom line? What's our takeaway? Well, it's clear we can find at least seven creative events in our own life, in our own world, in our own universe that have no apparent physical causation. Everything physical should have a cause. And now we have at least seven events that appeared virtually from nothing. So we call these primary, essential, or first order formation events. Given that random micro changes over time are virtually an impossible reality, then the most logical position is there is intervention in the creation on the part of a creator. The other term we could use is God. This is the only truly reasonable position.